Shouldn't down like that. Yeah. Oh, I should just present like this. Okay. Okay, I'm just gonna present like this. Um. So generalization is the problem of how to learn from a finite amount of training data such that you minimize the need for future learning or adaptation. Um, we complain a lot in the field that machine learning algorithms don't generalize, right? So you can expose the fragility of, um, of uh, modern machine learning algorithms simply by perturbing the input. Um, so you can do this either physically, you can inject noise that's imperceptible to humans, or you can, you know, physically perturb the object that is that is being um, uh, photographed, like by putting stickers on it, and it will change the model's prediction in ways that it shouldn't. Like we've known this for several years. Um, but something that we often don't think about as much is um, actually humans can be terrible at generalization too. Um, that's not to say that we fail at learning in the same ways, but we definitely both fail. Uh, uh, and in fact, you can look at um, generalization as the central problem for all learning processes, whether it's biological or artificial. Um, here's an example that I saw in The Guardian recently. It's quite sad, but relevant to our current reality which is this black skimmer bird feeding a cigarette to its chick, um, which it's misclassified as food. Um, why has this bird not generalized this test setting? Uh, well, we live in a fast chain world, and um, the, the larger the gap between what this bird has been trained for and what it's tested on, um, the more likely it is to make mistakes. And that's what we call distribution shift, uh, which we were just talking about. Um, so the sort of the, the pull of the question and the fascination of generalization uh, to me is the, the hypothesis that whether you're dealing with a biological learning agent or an artificial one, maybe the principles of generalization are the same. So uh, if we could understand generalization in general, then, then it wouldn't only be beneficial for the tools that we try to build with AI, but also um, perhaps for understanding the pathologies of learning more generally. Um, so why, for example, as humans, we make so many mistakes, or even why we get ill, because that's a pathology of adaptation, right, illness. Um, so the point is that generalization is a much bigger question um, than just uh, machine learning. And you can think of it as characterizing intelligence, um, the optimality of, of, of learning uh, in general. Um, so these days, there's a lot of interest in large scale um, models, so called foundation models. Um, the belief is that test performance seems to scale with, um, you know, the amount of training data and, and the, even the architecture size um, to, to, to some extent. So why not just make the training data enormous, make the model enormous, and then the generalization problem goes away. Um, I'm on the side that would disagree with that. Uh, to generalize the level that, that we want requires um, a high level understanding of the task, right? And um, it's pretty easy to see by looking at the mistakes, even of these large scale language models, for example, that um, either the training data or the learning algorithm or a combination of both um, have not induced the level of generalization that we seek. So size, it seems, is not enough. Also, we don't want a learning algorithm that only generalizes given X million training samples anyway, right? We want, we want the recipe for optimal generalization for any training data size, um, given any learning problem. So um, this work was inspired by an observation on how uh, humans generalize when we do generalize. Um, which is that we perform well on test inputs when there's only novelty at the low level, not at the high level. Um, for example, you know how to classify the elements of a road scene pretty reliably wherever you are in the world, right? Like no matter the weather, the orientation, the lighting, whatever. Um, 
So the details might be different from what you've observed in the past from your training data, but the high level is actually very familiar. Um, which means that your learned representation that maps the input to the high level representation um, has sort of compressed away all of the detail that is irrelevant or even um, distracting, harmful uh, for the task at hand. Uh, and what does lack of the at level mean? It means that the inputs are mapped close to representations of your training data. Right? Um, given some meaningful distance metric. So in other words, we would expect inference functions that generalize really well to use data representations um, that consist of most of densely supported by training samples in representation space. And the, the paper, uh, in a nutshell, is that we derive error bound, so it's an upper bound on test error, error on un unseen inputs, um, that scales exactly with training data density in representation space. So now I'm going to go into the details. Um, from the literature on expressivity of neural networks, we know that um, ReLU networks sort of define a partitioning of the input space into non overlapping polytopes, also called activation regions. Uh, where every point in a given activation region induces the same linear function that's computed by the network. So a new network can be considered a composition of different linear functions, basically. Um, and you can rewrite inference within your network as first look up the, um, uh, the activation pattern and then look up the linear function and, and compute the, the, the linear function um, defined by the network for that particular activation region. Um, and that subfunction, well, we call it subfunction, it's just linear function, um, varies in a fine grained manner with the input. So, so one could use an error bound, that subfunction, as a predictor of the generalization error for a particular sample. That's the basic idea. And this figure is illustrating a toy example. So, um, the first figure shows the half moon's training data set. Um, the second example shows the linear activation regions um, in input space of the trained model. Third and fourth plots show our error bound metric across um, input space. So it's prediction of, of generalization error. Um, so a problem with doing this in a naive way for a network is that most of the activation regions are empty. They're not filled by training samples. So a simple error bound is undefined because simple error bounds are basically empirical error plus um, a generalization gap metric. Um, and if you don't have training samples for that particular function, there's no empirical error. Um, and the way we resolve this is basically by smoothing the samples across input space. Um, so so uh, we, g given some, function which we call k um, we we basically do a weighted average of the um, uh, samples in the locality of a particular subfunctions activation region um, so that no region is without some training sample mass basically uh, and after the smoothing we get a new kind of empirical error which we call the smoothed empirical error um, denoted by r hat asterisk S in the green box, and correspondingly, we have a new generalization bound, and this bound split inversely with the density PHI, which is the training sample density of that, that particular subfunction. So basically, the more subfunction is surrounded by training samples in representation space, the better it's predicted generalization, that's what this bound is saying. Um, and this result holds for any weighting function K because the, the proof is basically assumes a worst case. Um, and obviously, it's, that makes it loose and it's vacuous, in fact, which means that um, values of the bound are higher than one when you know that you know, training error can't exceed one. But, but um, empirically, it actually turns out to be a really good predictor of generalization error. Um, so just because it's vacuous doesn't mean it's not meaningful. Um, so the experimental setup that we use is determining if a trained neural network will generalize uh, to a particular test sample. Uh, we take the test set we um, 
uh, compute the error bound metric um, per test sample, and then we rank the test samples in terms of their predicted unreliability. Um, you do a sweep across different thresholds that yields a different discrete accept reject sentence. You can summarize um, how good that that prediction is using area under curve metrics. Um, this is just some analysis that one of the reviewers mentioned because we do an approximation in the in the actual deep network experiments where we um, uh, the normalization constant is is biased because we basically assume that all of the activation regions are feasible when they aren't. Um, uh, and I'm not going to go into detail into this plot, but it's basically showing that it doesn't fundamentally affect the the ranking because the um, uh, basically, the relative rank of the subfunctions is preserved. It's the same. It's just a rescaling. Um, we tested how well our metric is a predictor on two kinds of, you know, poor generalization. One is in distribution misclassification, so that's just mistakes on the test set, and the other is out of distribution samples, um, and it does very well on both. Um, so the two best baselines were what were entropy, meaning conditional entropy of the outputs. Um, uh, the output distribution given the input and cluster distance, which is a, which is a paper from 2020, which is actually quite a um, similar idea at high level to ours. Uh, they also sort of use they cluster the representations and measure the distance to the uh, cluster centroids in, in representation space. Um, but it's less fine grained because we use basically every activation pattern as a centroid or a reference point, whereas they use a small number of discrete clusters. Um, but the main takeaway is that indeed. The more densely your test samples are, are surrounded by training samples, the more reliable prediction is. Here are just some uh, qualitative analysis without cherry picking. So if you inspect what samples actually correspond to high or low error bounds, you see this very intuitive um, uh, relationship between the visual typicality of that image and the in-distribution classes. Um, so basically, if the image looks like a typical example from the distribution classes, it's more likely to be to be um, accepted. It's more likely to have a low error bound. Um, and finally, just to extend that, you can also use this unreliability metric as um, well. You can run this unreliability unreliability metric on OOD samples to find which OOD classes are less OOD relative to the in distribution training classes. Um, so, so if you rank the classes, this is ranking SciFAR 100 images um, using a model trained on SciFAR 10, you can see a very strong correlation between low reliability, according to the error bound metric, and high semantic closeness to the in-distribution um, uh, test classes. Um, and that supports quite intuitive point. Um, that, that, that ID and OOD should not be considered a binary distinction. It sort of sits on a spectrum and you have um, uh, uh, data which is relatively less OOD, data which is relatively more OOD. Um, so you could view, for example, Cypher 100 as an extremely unlucky draw, in fact, of a natural image data set which is focused on the uh, classes. Um, and I think going forwards, this, this is a more useful way of viewing um, generalization than, than just the binary distinction that we often make between whether TESA is in distribution or out of distribution. And yeah, that's it. Thank you very much. Any other questions? So the question is, does the insight about density within subfunctions support, uh, transfer to other similar models like support vector um, regressions? Um, we didn't test that, but indeed, um, this, this idea about density being important for generalization is not a new idea, obviously. Um, uh, it was Gaussian processes, 
It relates to um, information bottleneck principle, which is another principle for, for generalization. Um, so yeah, the insight does transfer. <laughs> Um, I guess the novelty of this paper is the, the way that we derived this, this, this principle, um, which I think hasn't been, hasn't been done before, so it's sort of like another way of, of arriving at the same result. One last question regarding that. It seems to me that there are lots of things in this country. It seems to me that the conclusion of bottom line is that you rediscover the new thing. Basically, that's what you said. And when you put your, your precise bound with this square root uh, something on the number of examples, you're just talking about organization in a specific region that there is the error and there are tons of regions, and then this probability of error over, overruns everything. So it basically goes back to nearest neighbor and the question of dependent relation. Data in function, how many, how, how small should those regions be, and how many regions should they be? Yeah. So it seems like you could really discover nearest neighbor, and I recommend you to read my extended machine learning book, both for the examples that relate to animals and analysis of nearest neighbor. Okay. Well, I mean, nearest neighbor is, is, is an inference algorithm, and here we are looking at the quality. Of an inference algorithm, right? Okay. And this will come into it again if you try to generalize. You have a bound on a specific region, but then you don't have many. And how many regions you're going to have depends on the synthesis. And this is exactly what you analyze and analyze the success of this. Okay.